well, sorry about all that. Um, that looks like a lot of people are sort of maybe don't fit in that bucket. So what I was thinking we could do is this talks about half an hour. Uh, some of it's a little esoteric uh, and not super down to earth, uh, <laughs> but maybe useful for other people. Uh, if you're one of the ones who wants to like learn something about go like be more hands on, uh, afterwards we could do a little bit of a tutorial or something. I have a bit of a programming problem we can work on. If anybody's interested in that, so just meet me afterwards and we'll do that. Uh, so this talk, the basic idea is that uh, I wanted to show some ways that Go is interesting and different than other programming languages. Uh, I don't know if anybody read this article. It's on Hacker News and other places. Um, you can see the link down here. Incidentally, uh, I put this bit.ly link up here if you're interested in the presentation. Um, and so uh, this quote is from that article. It says, uh, I hope my complaints reveal a little bit about how uh, about how Go doesn't really do anything new, Go isn't well designed from the ground up, and Go is a regression from other modern programming languages. And I think this is a very common sentiment in the community. A lot of people feel this way about Go. And to be honest, I think a lot of Go uh, developers uh, will wear this sentiment as a badge of honor, right? Uh, because programming is not just about having the best ideas and working on something crazy new, it's really about getting things done. And I think a lot of you, I mean, I think that way, and I think a lot of developers do as well. And Go is very much a language of getting things done. It's uh, well designed in that sense, and it's very easy to use, and you can make very good code that is uh, effective. But I want to say that this is actually not true at all. And actually, some of the decisions Go makes are pretty radical, and radical in ways that are surprising. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about two of those ways, and then I'll go into an actual example of how to write some code uh, using them. Uh, so the first example actually has nothing to do with the language per se. So I'll give you a little brief history of computing here. You start with hardware, this ENIAC river computer that uh, was programming as switches and cables. So if you were to reprogram it, you had to like unplug things and plug them in. Right? It took a very long time. And so one of the first innovations in computing was software uh, and the stored program computer. So this is the von Neumann architecture. Modern computers follow the same architecture. The idea is you store your program in memory along with your data. Right? And so uh, this means you can program using machine code, but of course, as soon as you can do that, you can have a program which makes other programs, right? And so that's like an assembler for assembly, or a programming compiler, like Go, for example, or C or any other programming language. And that sort of opens up the world of what we can do with it, right? Uh, and the first thing you'll notice when you start going down that avenue is once you start making more complex pieces of software, uh, is you have code that needs to be reused. And so we introduce libraries, right? Uh, I had a little mathematical function I wrote for program A, and I want to be able to use it in program B. Uh, and so the simplest way of doing that is static linking. Okay, So I literally take that code and copy it into the other program. I'm reusing it, right? I'm getting that advantage, but it's actually a copy of the original code. Now there's sort of two problems you get with that, and probably others. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> the two basic problems are, uh, <clears throat> you're, since you're copying it, you end up with a lot of redundant code. Uh, and in machines that had not a lot of memory, that was a big problem, right? It's not very much of a problem anymore. Nobody would really care about extra code, but that was one issue. The other issue was if you wanted to change it. And that's a bigger problem even today, right? So to give you an example, OpenSSL, security library that everybody uses, uh, frequently has bugs which are incredibly important to get fixed. And so I have 10 programs. They all use OpenSSL. It would be nice to just o update that once and all of them get the update. And so that's the dynamic linking approach. Uh, and so at an operating system, you'll we'll see DLLs and Windows and SOs and Unix. And these are shared code libraries. And the way it works is I make my program, and the compiler it inserts basically a symbol. And then when the program is run, it replaces that symbol with the address of the actual library or whatever. Um, and so, but this is like a bigger idea. It's not just an operating system thing. It's like a, an approach to doing software. And so you see it with compiled virtual machine languages like Java and .NET, they have dynamic linking in the sense they have DOLs, they have Java jars, and you see it even interpret languages, right? Ruby, Python, Node.js. In other words, what I'm saying is, if I write a program in Python, it depends on a library. I need to have that library installed on the machine in order to use my program, okay? That's dynamic linking. So I like to think of it this way. Dynamic linking is in some ways the fruit in the garden, right? And it looks amazing. You say, if we could have this 
we would be gods, right? That's the idea. <laughs> so there's Eve offering the apple, and, and we had taken that fruit, but what we didn't realize is that this was uh, original sin, right? This is the curse. <laughs> maybe you don't agree with me, but to give you an example, I made this slide of things, technologies that people use. And in some ways, all of these technologies are examples of ways to handle the problems introduced by dynamic living. So these two up here, Chef and Puppet, are ways of doing uh, IT automation, uh, which in a lot of ways is installing libraries like OpenSSL. Why do I need to install those in the end system? Because my program depends on them, right? Uh, these are all dependency management systems, uh, and uh, you know, for example, Bundler and Ruby or whatever. And this one is really interesting, Docker. So Docker is I can make containers. And the cool thing about containers is I can run them anywhere. Which, if you think about it, is static linking. So it's taking a dynamically linked programming language and turning it into a static linked uh, So anyway, to get back to Go, Go is a statically linked uh, compiled programming language. So it never took the fruit, right? And I think, I'm not even sure the inventors of the language realized they were doing that on purpose, as much as, since Plan 9 didn't do it, they were like, well, why would we do it, right? Like, they didn't even think that. Way. And so Go is very radical in the sense that most programming languages are dynamically linked, but Go is not. Okay. Uh, so this is how compilation in Go works. Uh, this is important because I think there's a bit of misinformation about dependency management in Go. A lot of people complain that Go doesn't have a good dependency management solution. Right? It doesn't have Bundler. It doesn't have NPM. Um, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that that's not as big a deal as people made it, because uh, since it's statically compiled, uh, you don't have to worry so much about when you put it out and run it, right? It's going to work. And so this is how it works in Go, sort of to make this point. Uh, you have these three folders, right? So if you have a workspace, you have these three folders, bin, package, source. All your source code is stored in the source folder, right? And so the name of the library, like this is givehub.com slash nf slash to do, uh, that is the package name when you include it, right? It's really simple. It's laid out in folders. And then when I run go git and go build and go install, they look in these various folders for the thing. So if I run go install, it's going to take this and put it in the bin folder. And this is a package main. That's the way. And if it's not a package main, it put it in the package. Folder. Okay. And so it's really simple layout. If you understand this, and if you don't understand this, I would definitely recommend reading the stock, uh, which is on the GoLang website. Like I said, if you can't read that, it's on there, or you still go and got worried. Um, and we'll explain how this works. It's pretty simple. You can understand it in like half an hour. And the reason I think that's important is that dependency management in Go is easy because dependencies are a build time issue, not a runtime issue. Okay? If you get your source code in the right place, you're done. So it's just a matter of getting the source code in the right place. There are tools that can do that, like these tools, uh, GPM, GoDev, uh, I guess. Uh, but you don't even need a tool. You could write a bash script that could do this. It's actually that simple. Um, and in fact, the naive approach of just doing go get, which always gets you the latest head version, uh, that works pretty good. And the reason it works pretty good is you're doing this at build time. It's not an issue you get when you say, oh, deploy my code. It's an issue you get when I'm writing code, which is exactly the time when you can fix a problem that you find. Okay? Uh, but if you're concerned about versioning, there are ways to do it. Uh, in fact, one of the ways is called vendoring, and that's where you actually copy the code, right? So instead of being github.com slash nf slash do, you sort of put it in your own namespace. And so you're sort of forking their project and making it yours. Uh, so that's one approach. But you can also version with these tools. Uh, basically, you'll have a file that will list the projects and a version, and it will make sure you get that version every time you go. Um, so that's the finish managing go. The bigger point being, though, static binding is great. Okay, It makes a lot of these problems way easier to do. Okay, so here's the second topic I want to talk about. Uh, Ralph Pike has this article, which is a great article. You should read it, called Less is Exponentially More. You just search for that and go over to find it. Um, and he has this quote. Uh, he says, if C++ and Java are about type hierarchies and the taxonomy of types, Go is about composition. And what he's driving at here, he asks this question of why is it that Go has not been popular with C++ programmers? Um, and I think he discovers, in, and he writes about it here, the reason why is it's something very fundamental to the approach of writing software. And so uh, this. Right here, so traditional object-oriented, and this is also true of strongly typed functional programming languages, focus on types as the fundamental building blocks of software. So in Java, C++, C Sharp, um, 
and in Haskell and Scala, and I think even probably newer programming languages like Swift and Rust, the, the approach you're taking is you think about types as your fundamental building blocks. So uh, when you start, you're saying, I need to develop a piece of software that does X. You say, what are my types? That's where you're going to start, right? You're going to go to type hierarchy, and then from there, your code will flow out. Okay. Now, Go, Go's approach is not like that. It's very different. Um, in the Go approach, you're going to start with sort of, what do I need to make it do? And then as you write your program, your, your types will emerge. You'll discover the types in the program. Um, and we'll see an example, maybe, of how that works in a second. Uh, but I think this is actually a really fundamental disagreement, and it has areas in more than just programming. Uh, so <laughs> this is a famous painting called The School of Athens. Um, and the two figures, well, does anybody know the two figures in, in the center? Plato and Aristotle. Thank you. Uh, so yes, Plato and Aristotle. And what's interesting about this painting, you'll notice that Plato is pointing upwards. It's Da Vinci Aristotle. in there too also. Yeah, Aristotle's mm -hmm. like downwards, right? And so this is in some ways not entirely accurate. I mean, that's just sort of, I don't, I don't want to get into philosophy too much here. But uh, in Plato's philosophy, types, or what he calls forms, or categories in some ways, or like this idea of form, which is very similar to type, is fundamental. That's the most important thing. And the famous analogy he gives is called the algorithm cave. And if you imagine the way he positions this is, you imagine you have uh, several people, they're chained up, and they're staring at a wall, okay, in a cave. And behind them is a, a fire. And then there's people in front of the fire, but behind them, who have shapes that they're putting up. And they see on the back of the wall shadows, right? So they see people walking across, but shadows of people, right? Um, and this is how they've lived their entire lives. So all they see are the shadows on the back wall, right? That's the idea. Now, imagine if they were to be unchained and to look around and see the things for themselves, right? They finally saw the things that made the shadows, right? And imagine furthermore that they left the cave and saw the real world as it was, right? Um, so you could say, you could say, that the wonder and power of higher order, let's say lazy and pure functions, are unfurled before them, right? <laughs> In all their splendor. But then they discover that actually, like, making a program that says hello world is really hard, right? And that'd be true of Haskell, right? And that's, I think in some ways, when you discover Haskell, you, <laughs> you get that sensation of, you feel that power of, I have finally experienced the world as it is, I can sort of move on. But I think sometimes we overestimate our ability to analyze the world around us and really see the types as they are, okay? And I, see, I think you see that problem in languages like Java and C++. We, we sort of come up with a solution, and then we try to put it on the problem, and it doesn't fit so well. And then we try to make the problem sort of fit into it. It becomes really difficult. So I think, in some sense, Go's approach is much better, because it makes it so that we can get a solution that's better suited. Um, but to get back to the original point I made, you don't have to agree with me on that. I'm just saying that this is something of fundamental disagreement. Okay. And that you can see how somebody could have a different opinion. That doesn't mean that Go is a badly designed language. It just means it's very different. Okay? That's the point. OK, so here's the example of uh, composition. Um, here's an example of program that you have rectangle, right? And rectangle has area. You have circle. Circle has area. They both implement the shape, in shape interface. Notice they don't implement the shape interface. You never say that. The shape interface sort of emerges from the types. Because they happen to both have the area function, they get the shape interface. Um, so Go is generally, your, your writing has a relationship. So that's the composition bit. So I say A has a B. I don't say A is a B. Okay. This gives you something like B is a relationship. But it's not, you're not building the hierarchy. It's getting you sort of one level up. Um, and so generally the focus is on has a, right? Uh, whereas in other languages this focus is on is a. Um, and to give you another example where this composition is useful, you can imagine Unix pipes, where you have one program, its output goes to the input of another program. And as long as you make a program which can take that data and do stuff with it, you can swap it out with a different program, right? So that's Unix pipes. And, and Go's model is very similar to that. So the example I want to look at is Russian doll coding. That's what I'm going to call it, okay? <laughs> and so in Russian doll coding, we have little things we have bigger things which look like the little things and have them inside of them, and then you sort of build up from there. Okay. 
What's nice about this approach to coding is it's sort of easy to break down a very complex problem into a much simpler problem. Okay? And Go is actually extremely well suited for these types of problems. And so uh, this is a program I worked on uh, a few months ago. I had to create an app which would take a, a song or some other MP3 and some several other MP3s, small ones, and insert them into it and do this streaming. And so you can imagine you have a piece of music and you want to put ads in it, right? This is sort of a use case. Um, and so this is the idea. I have MP3 1, MP3 2, and 3. I'm inserting them into the first one, and then I want to stream that over HTTP, okay? Go is incredibly well suited for a problem like this. It can do it extremely efficiently, and it's really easy to understand. And this is an example of a problem that falls apart from languages like Ruby, um, which we'll see in a second. Uh, so here's the basic structure of what that program would look like. Package bane, you import the things, and then you make this HTTP handle funk. And this is how you write an HTTP handler in Go. It's pretty simple. Uh, I just set the content type to audio MPEG, and then uh, this temp IO read seeker bit is the bit that we're going to implement. Okay. Uh, but basically, HTTP comes with the serve content function, which makes this really easy. Uh, and so it, it sets the appropriate headers. Uh, it handles range. So for example, if I got disconnected, reconnect, it will resume the download. Like this sort of content will handle that bit for you. Uh, and it does so by implementing this read seeker interface. Uh, so what is the read seeker interface? Um, it's really simple. It's the reader interface and the seeker interface. Hence the name read seeker. And reader is just uh, I read data and put it into a slice of bytes, okay? And so it's a forward only kind of idea. Um, and then seeker means I can move where that starts, okay? So a good example of a read seeker is a file, right? I can have a file, I can sort of move where I want to go into that file, and then I can start reading. And then I can move somewhere else and start reading again, okay? And seek and read are very familiar if you're used to working with files. So, um, basically, what we want to do is create a splice function, okay? And so I want to create a new read seeker, which is the result of splicing several other read seekers into the first one at given offsets. So this would be the sort of function I want to try and implement. Uh, I have my source. This will be the initial file, and then I have the splice map, okay? And so imagine I want to say insert one file at five seconds, insert another one at ten seconds, okay? And I would build that, um, and then that's going to return another read seeker. So, this is the Russian doll bit here, right? I'm taking read seeker and making a new read seeker, okay? Um, so if we were to put that in code, what I'm trying to do is this. Imagine I open three files, and then I create my temp, my IO read seeker we saw before, uh, with the call to splice, right? Everybody following this? Any questions so far? <laughs> um, and so here's my five seconds, here's my 10 seconds, and I want to create this thing. Now notice, this is actually a really small bit of code, right? Like, and I haven't actually implemented Splice yet, but like this is pretty, I can, you know, get started with that. Um, so here's like the way I started first. And this is the, very similar to how you would do this in something like Ruby, okay? I said, why don't I just use FFmpeg? FFmpeg is a program out there that can do these kinds of things. It can convert audio, it can concatenate audio files, it can split them, et cetera. Um, so it already exists, but I just call. Okay. So you can use OS slash exec, which will let you call programs from your Go program, and then you can give it its thing, which you can look up online how to do this, and then uh, take that resulting MP3 and serve it via HTTP. Okay. The problem with this is you get lots of temporary files, which can be kind of clunky to manage uh, because you got to make sure you delete them after you're done with them, um, and it ended up using a lot of memory, which I was really mm -hmm. disappointed how FFmpeg did this, it did not do this efficiently. It turns out with an MP3, if you have MP3s of all the same format, you can splice them together on the fly without needing to sort of pull the whole thing in, okay? Um, you can take pieces of one and put it in the other. The format allows for that. So it was really disappointing that it didn't do that for me. And of course, this last one, back to the dynamic linking problem, it requires FFmpeg on the server. And who wants to put FFmpeg on their web server? So, um, <laughs> So we want to implement this in Go, and so this, there's basically two ways I want to build this. I need two things. I need a multi-read seeker, which takes multiple read seekers and compactates them together. Okay. So I have read seeker one, read seeker two, and then up to read seeker n. And this would be the function definition. Okay. 
So I need to be able to build this thing. And basically, that, the way that would work is if I seek past the first file, I would seek into the second file. Okay? And if I read past it the same, same way. So it treats multiple files as one big file. That's what I'm trying to do. Um, and the other piece I need is a section read seeker. And that is, instead of the whole file, I just want a piece of it. Okay? And so it treats this uh, uh, sort of this bit here in the middle as a file. Okay? This is actually really simple to do. This guy is a little tricky. Okay? You got some edge cases you got to think about. Um, but I think you can kind of see how one would implement something like that. Okay? Um, and the same goes for this. You can see how, given an offset and a length, I can implement this. Basically, the way it would work is if I read past the end of the file, I would return an error instead of returning. Okay. Um, and then everything that uses readers would know how to handle it, okay? because they all implement the same interface. Um, so to sort of get back to how we started, I have this uh, original file. And this is the code I would call inside of Splice. I would say new multi-read seeker, new section read seeker, and I give it from zero to A, so that's the first bit. Um, and then I'd say file two, and then new section read seeker of the first file A to B, and then F3, and then B and B. Okay. So now I have five pieces, I glue them all together, um, and then I have this resulting read seeker that does everything I want it to do. Uh, so the only thing that are left are, well, first of all, I need to handle MP3s properly, right? And so an MP3 is made up of headers, and I pre tag, and then frames in the middle. So basically, I created a strip function, which just gives you the middle bit. Okay. And what would this return? Just like what would this call? Anybody there? Byte array. <laughs> this would return a uh, section read seeker, right? This is just a section read seeker of a file. Right? I, but I just need to process the first bit to know how to do that. Um, the other thing I need to create is something to turn uh, a time, like five seconds, into an offset. Uh, that turns out to be really easy if you read the spec on an MP3 to do. Uh, the frames tell you how long they are. And you can find formulas that will do this. And then maybe create new headers and throw them in the game. If, maybe. You, you don't have to do that. You can just return data. Um, the other reason you need to do the frames is so you don't cut in the middle of the frame. But the truth is, actually, if you just did the dumb thing, it would probably work OK. You get like a little glitch in the file, but people probably wouldn't notice. Um, so. Uh, so to reiterate our, our final thing, this is the Russian doll thing, right? Uh, I have my outer multi-read seeker. Inside of it, I have section read seekers. And they have pointers to files. Okay? That's the idea. And so the reason why this is a powerful way to approach programming is I can think about making this as a sort of really simple, small problem. And then I can think about making this as a small problem. And then once I've done that, I've already finished all the work I need to do for the big problem. Okay. Uh, and so that's the composition, not in the sense of having data, but in the sense of thinking about a problem. It's actually very similar to functional programming. So, uh, but it's not functional. It's kind of a different, <laughs> different thing. So other examples of this kind of thing, you see it all over the place in I.O. And they love their readers in I.O. It's, it's great. See so a limit reader, which would only read up to a certain limit. And then you have multi-readers, which is like our multi-read seeker, combines a bunch of readers together. You have T-reader, which is kind of cool because it like reads, and then as it's reading, it writes to another thing. Uh, super handy. Um, you see this idea in compression. Uh, I have a reader. I want to compress it. You can feed it to GZIP. It creates a new reader that's now compressed. Right? And anything that uses a reader can use your compressor. So it's really simple. Um, and then there was a great talk at GopherCon where he built web services using this basically implemented the HTTP handler at various levels to build an entire web stack. Um, so this is a super powerful idea of sort of the Russian doll coding. I don't know if this is a better name for it, but you'll see it all over the place. Okay, so that is uh, basically it. Okay, so. <laughs> So in uh, functional programming, you, you see this, uh, we'll take an example like Haskell. But because it's pure, you can reason about functions in a way where you can put them together really easily. Uh, and, and so you sort of see that similar here, right, where I'm reasoning about this bigger thing and making it smaller and smaller, and then sort of gluing. In functional, you glue the functions together. Right. And in this, you're gluing these interfaces together. So that's the idea. Um, 
I, I like it. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean for, but the, when your, your point about um, Haskell making hard things, I mean, easy things hard, <laughs> but it also tends to uh, make impossible things doable. Yeah. So in a sense of, yes, it is hard in, um, if you're coming from the, hey, I just want to get shit in and out, um, then, you know, yes, it starts to look much more complicated. Right. But it isn't until you're actually, uh, and this was one of the criticisms that a friend of mine uh, made was, um, and I was curious what, what your take on it was, is that um, the, the Go code that you would write for, say, four cores would not necessarily be the same Go code you'd write for 32 or 64. Uh, so that's, it's, it's tricky because I think sometimes programmers think, oh, I have more cores. If I use them, my program will work faster. And that's not really true because you have to change the way you think about what your program does in order to take advantage yeah. of that. And so, for example, my code here. Okay. I'll go all the way back to this guy. Is not threads it. I could not like break this up into pieces and make it work. The point is, it doesn't actually matter because this is a concurrent program. If you look at the very beginning, because what if two people stream an MP3? Right. They both get it. Now each one of these pieces is serial and sequential, not multi-threaded. But the thing as a whole, my program as a whole is. And so when it comes to a web service, it's actually not very important for me to think in terms of making my sort of working code concurrent because it does more than one thing at a time, right? And so it's handling multiple requests. So that's what's more important. Um, but as far as, as uh, so I, I think uh, in Go, the point is that those things aren't worth talking about. They're like for different reasons, right? And so you could make this uh, concurrent, you could use candles and things. And I don't think it would make your program go any faster because this is an IO bound problem. Um, and just, and theor so just theoretically, though, it was what you said, right? If you had a problem with CPU bound and you were, you know, multi core of CPU and you could go from a two core to a 32 core, do you have to write your code differently? Um, <coughs> I guess what I'm saying is in this example, I would not. I get that. Yeah. I'm just, yeah. It's and a very I, situational think, sort of problem. Yeah. yeah. It, I mean, if you're if you're processing a lot of data and you know it's going to take a lot of time, but it's something that you know you can just simply throw at multiple cores, yeah. then you would probably write it the same way, okay. and just use more cores. Um, but if if you've got something that, Is that doesn't necessarily to? benefit from more cores, it's like well, if I run the serial, it's, it's I get just that. as fast. Yeah, you know? I, get I guess I'm just asking if you have a problem like that, do you have to build it that way to begin with. You know, if you're working on a you know quad core laptop, you have to write it differently to if the one time put on the Xeon process or something. Not really. Okay, well, you I, have to say how many cores you're gonna. Right. Uh, I so I think that the point is that that um, just throwing more cores at a problem actually doesn't usually result in much. Uh, most problems, if they're like this, it's not gonna do anything for you, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so that, that can be a real tricky area. And I think that's also a confusion about Go. People see Go and they're like, oh, it's super parallel. It's like, well, no, no, no. That's not what it's trying to do. And so that's a different sort of area. And Haskell has some tricks for some of that. But I don't think you can just take uh, a problem and say, if we have a board that it goes faster. That's just not the way we, can, we should think about it. Yeah, I, I guess what he said, I, I would say from a compositional perspective, yeah. you wouldn't necessarily write it much different. You might tweak it slightly if you were like, Okay, I'm going to optimize it because I know I have X number of cores, and I'm going to optimize this to run that exact number of cores, and you know, not do anything crazy. But um, it, it's really about does the problem warrant multiple cores? I get that. So if it doesn't warrant it, and, and, and that's a that's a something that people run into all the time is that when it comes to Go, you're like, oh, this is great. What you're saying, you're like, let me just throw more cores at it, but that doesn't necessarily. Problem. Well, like if I want to crawl the internet, so I want to pull down 100,000 pages. Yeah. yeah, but if you want to crawl the internet, right, you're going to end up like spinning out a bunch of Go routines, one for each website, one yeah. for each crawl pathway. Yeah. Whether or not you're writing in a single core, 500 cores. Yeah, single core. And then whether or not you run it on one core, 500 cores, if you're spinning out the Go routine for every website, it'll automatically parallelize. I mean, that's fun because it's an embarrassingly parallel problem, yeah. except for storage. But besides that, you can do that. It'll and network out. Yeah. yeah <laughs> But that set is a good example because 90% of your code is like doing the work of fetching this URL and processing it. And that bit stays the same. And all you do is say, now go do that 100 times. Right? Like that's, 
so those two things, they're, like I said, they're orthogonal. They're different. They're, they go together really nicely. And actually, um, if I if I had spent more time on this, I, I think the next step of this is, like I said, this isn't thread saving, and that's kind of an issue you can get if you're not careful. Um, and to see how this like dovetails nicely into channels, and and so we see a little of the HDB bit, but that is like the next step is like, oh, okay, I see why channels are the way they are because they go together really nicely. Like this, so because those are sort of two different things. That's fine. Um, okay. Any other questions? All right. Why are you saying it's not thread safe? Uh, what, what I'm saying is that if you, if I had that multi read, uh, read seeker and I had two threads try to use it, oh, it would yeah, be, that's true. like this would seek and you start getting the data from the wrong way, it'd be bad. So, um, and actually there's a really tricky, like I said, making that multi read seeker can be a little tricky uh, because even though it, if you did it with just one thread, it's, notice how I'm using the same file multiple times. Uh, so when it goes to the next file, it needs to make sure to see first, because otherwise it will be starting in the wrong place. So there's sort of little edge cases like that. And that's probably why multi-read seeker doesn't exist in the standard library. Like it's not a super obvious how you implement this. Um, whereas multi-reader is, because you just start reading the next one. Like it's really simple. But, uh, so there's a little bit of trickiness there. But basically I was just trying to say that you can't use that one thing for multiple voices. Yeah. Um, yeah, as long as um, your, um, which I, you know, again, you know, full disclosure, I come from Haskell, so, um, uh, my, and my excitement was initially, I found, initially I was a dynamic typer, thought that was the way to live, and blah, blah, blah. I've since, since suffered the pain of what happens when things are a bit too dynamic. Um, but my question is, um, with regard to the interfaces, how strict are they? Can I wrap shit as something else and force it down an interface? I don't, I don't think I understand. They're very strict in the sense that you have to implement the method as it's defined. So you would just describe it as strong static or weak static? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm get, I'm well, to question. give you an example, like uh, let's say I'm you know, writing something in Haskell. Basically, um, if I set up the interface to be an int, you know, basically an, uh, a limited um, allocation of memory. If I clap on an integer into it anywhere in that entire function, boom. Milo says no. This all has to be either all in, an integer all the way through or int all the way through. In some of the object-oriented languages, yes, you get that in the interfaces, but you can trick it into thinking it's getting, you know, an any type or you know some other way to wrap it so that I can just force it through where otherwise, technically, according to the language, should not go. Um, I'm not sure I can answer the question, but uh, yes. Go does, which another thing interesting about that, that article was he said that there was no unsafe capabilities which can go, which is completely false. There's an unsafe library which lets you do anything. So you could, <laughs> you could put data somewhere and say, no, it's now a float, and it would let you do that. Uh, that would be unsafe, but you could do that. So yes, you could trick it that way. Uh, but as far as if it's an int, it is an int. It's not like C. It doesn't like auto things. Okay, that's like you have to be what I wanted. Okay. Uh, first project. So, the first project to use it? No, the first project to use Go. Oh, I use it. Um, it's probably a website. Uh, just playing around. Uh, the first sort of like real serious one I did, I worked for a company where we had a deployment system. And it sort of, it does something very similar with that kind of project. Go uh, does a pretty good job if you have to like call lots of programs and manage files and stuff. It does pretty good. Very similar with Python with you. Um, yeah. Uh, so someone told me that music is going to be or doing real time music software with Go is going to be a okay. hard problem because the hardware itself wasn't really concurrent or truly concurrent underneath, and I still have no idea what they meant by that. Like, no, that's, I don't know. So the Go schedule is very sophisticated and it uses the cores available. Uh, if you set it up, there's a runtime thing you have to do, but. Um, Maybe they're saying that, like, uh, for example, with newer processors, they have the, uh, they can do multiple things at the same time, right? SM, SIMD, all that stuff. Uh, but the truth is actually, and I, I wrote an article about assembly of Go, uh, and if you go look at the bath library, for example, it has tons of assembly. 
and they have optimized some of those functions. And so if you wanted to, you could write a function that uses those instructions. In other words, you could do eight multiplies at once or whatever. Yeah. It is possible. You'd have to write an assembly though, but you should not do that. Yeah, my friend wrote a fast matrix map library and it just like do that stuff. Okay, cool, but still I was wondering if there's something with like the cores that's going on. I mean um, I would just dismiss this question, but this person probably works a lot closer to the actual Yeah. Um, it, it it might be an example like uh, with Erlang, which gives you much more much better guarantees. Okay. So maybe it's something like that, right? Or like Chuck, which is like strongly timed book and book. Yeah. Okay. Because there's no guarantee like that this go routine will not run for this much time and this one will run. It doesn't do anything like that. So yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. It's magic. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. I have it's probably a simple one. So the go path thing you had at the beginning, am I supposed to I set up a common area to like to pull down the GitHub stuff like database libraries, uh -huh. drivers? So am I supposed to pull that into my project and just create everything yeah. self contained? Is that the whole yeah. philosophy? Uh, when you do go get and go path? Like so there are different approaches to that problem. Uh, one is to have one big go path. Okay. And you would just pull the code down into this folder. <coughs> uh, actually, you don't have to. You just do go get. And if you have this environmental variable, the go path environmental stuff, you'll put it So is that for your project? Then just project based where you do it? Because say, you know, if you have three different programs you're working on, you, do you have one go path per project? Or is that just. That, that would be the approach of having one go path for all of them. Okay. Uh, which actually is not a bad approach you can get away with. It, um, it depends on, it kind of depends, if it's just like your company's code, yeah. one go path is probably pretty good. Uh, because if, if you sort of are interfering with each other, you, sh you should, in all your projects, be using the same version of some library. Otherwise, you're going to have other headaches. So um, if you can get away with it, that's nice. But that's not always possible. If you depend on some third party program that depends on a version of the library you're not using, then should we get this collision, right? In other words, say there were two versions of this task library. I have some program that uses one and another program that uses a different one. Well, this is all in one place and that kind of stuff too. Uh, and so you can, the other approach is to have different go paths. And so you can set up a go path for one one. Uh, and then would you pull down the, the libraries for GitHub each for each one? Go right. Get. And then you would like do git checkout and give it the version of one. And then you which just, the, the other tools would do for you. And then you have to just say go run to do dot go and it, it does all the other files together. You don't have to do any kind of make files or anything like that. No, that's right. It, it's all based on the go path. Uh, and in fact, those other tools, they do things like uh, you run the command of the name of the tool and then go run whatever. And what it does is adds to the go path. The, the, uh, it has a little folder built on it. So, so those tools will do it for you, uh, these tools. Uh, if, if you, you can look at them and see how they do it. Okay. But yeah, there are approaches. Anything else? Yeah. So, um, you talked a bit about static linking. Uh, obviously, with static linking, you can have bigger file files. Yeah. At the bottom. So, how efficient is the linkage tools in Go? As far as how granular can it go down to like a function level or package level? Or about yeah, I'm not sure about that. Go, Go binaries right now, and this is a known issue, are large. Uh, though, large. So, I work on a lot of Java code, and our <laughs> apps <laughs> are 180 megs. They're not that big, so <laughs> anything that's to be is an improvement, right? They're like 10 megs or 20 megs. Or, yeah, so they're not crazy big, but yeah, I don't know how. This also falls apart with when you're linking to C programs. It doesn't quite, some of those are dynamic. So, uh, but for Go code itself, yeah, I think that is something to work about to try and make it not crazy big. You can use, um, there's that uh, executable or uh, compression you can do, UPX or whatever. There's a project out there that can do it for Go. That helps a little bit, uh, maybe 75 percent. I, I don't know. So. Um, but I, you can also use uh, differential compression when you push out your code, right? And so, say like 10k of a change, but that's like all pushes. Um, so, our sync will do that. Other programs do that. How do you pin the version? Um, so the way that most of these work is there is a file in your project. A go dev file, which has in it the list of projects that you depend on and their versions. Um, and you just say go dev or whatever. It doesn't. Um, or you just use head, and then that's what's deep. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, regarding binary size, just to, as an answer, um, something that happens in the Go community as well is instead of bringing in a whole library, you might just crop out a bit of code that you need 
uh, which would be a bit more duplication, but it will get your binary sizes down. And you'll see this in the standard library. That's true. Like there are certain uh, string functions, parsing integers into strings and stuff like that, and vice versa. Uh, there's a whole library that does that in the standard library, but for things like, I, I want to say the HTTP package, they decided not to take a dependency on the big sort of conversion library and just brought out the two or three functions they need and just pasted them right in, which is pretty legit. Yeah. Uh, I think that's also another interesting thing that's sort of unique about Go is they are not afraid to violate the dry principle, and they will do so. And so, for example, you'll see that with, you know, how do I do a map in Go? And they're like, let's use a for loop. And you're like, that's not a map. It's like, but it is. It's only three lines. It's not like, sometimes repeating yourself is okay. And that's an example where they do too, where it's like, you know, it's it's like a very small function, so why don't we just repeat it? It's not a big deal. And we see that with testing a lot, because you don't want to have libraries for your tests. So, no one's ever been fired for using a for loop. <laughs> 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 right. Sure. Somebody should post that. Uh, that's what my friend did already. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, it's already been a space man. I'm not here to steal his name or whatever. Any other uh, questions? Um, no? Okay, I think we're done. Uh, so, is anybody interested in uh, sort of having a tutorial thing? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> or we could just uh, chat. <laughs> <All right. laughs>